Welcome back to Press Here. I am really rather proud of some of the issues we've taken on on this show. Not just the controversial stuff, but complicated stuff. Things like quantum computing and carried interest tax structure and this morning genomics. This is video inside the offices of Pleasanton's 10X Genomics where scientists are building the tools that will cure cancer and prevent aging and solve disease by concentrating on single cells. The company has grown 2,000% since 2015 and is now worth more than a billion dollars. Obviously, 10X Genomics founder and CEO Dr. Serge Saxenov is a smart man, but what impressed me most is what he doesn't know, telling Bloomberg, quote, the big obstacle is how little underlying science we actually know. Biology is really complex, and we can see only 5 or 10% of it. Saxonov was the first employee at genetics company 23andMe and grew up in the Soviet Union. Thanks for being with us this morning. I think I, I'm very impressed by what you said about not knowing what you don't know, but i got to start with the, just the basic stupid question. What's the difference between genetics and genomics? It's actually a good question. Just a lot of people are confused. Uh, genetics is a study of inheritance, how traits get passed from children uh, from parents Makes to their sense. children yes fruit flies and, yeah and genomics is really a study of the genome which is the six billion letters of dna that determine uh, a lot of your biology so it's Fair really enough. about the study of biology going back to that quote what i got from that is now that we have this science that you're able to give to scientists we are at a pivot point in which we are going to learn a tremendous thing a, a number of things that a stethoscope or a microscope could never have told us in many ways, that's, that's right. Right now, I understand, as the quote suggested, my, my fundamental belief, and I think that's what underlies the conception of the company, you understand very little of the underlying biology. And uh, if you look at the, what does that mean in the real world, is like when companies, when pharmaceutical companies are developing drugs, for example, 90% of the drugs that enter clinical trials fail. And the reason is we're trying to, uh, we, it's kind of like trying to fix a car without knowing how the, car, the car, cars work. Right, we're kind of stumbling, stumbling in the dark, trying to try things, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And so the, the point is, for us, is to kind of step back and appreciate the fact that actually we don't actually know that much biology. Let's work on understanding a lot more of it, and that requires fundamentally better tools that can measure the underlying biology. It's really, really complex. We have, as I mentioned, this huge long genome, six billion letters long. We've got 40 trillion cells. Every human has close to 40 trillion cells, each of them expressing its own genetic program based on that genome. So, and there's all these kind of molecules and messages communicating with each other in intricate ways. So that complexity is daunting. And the way to address it is to build tools that now allow us to see it. And that's what your company is doing. You've got a billion dollar valuation company now serving essentially the people who are doing this research. But can you explain actually what the business model is? I mean, how big of a business is this? Yeah, so uh, what we do is we give tools to scientists to understand biology to ultimately cure disease and mm -hmm. advance human health. There's lots of scientists, lots of biologists, lots of clinicians who can use these kinds of tools. We sell, our products is a combination of hardware, chemistry, and software. So we sell uh, instruments. It's kind of like an espresso machine type of model. Mm -hmm. We sell an instrument up front, and then they buy cartridges kind of in chemicals from us to run that instrument. And so mm -hmm. there is an ongoing source of revenue. For every experiment that a scientist run, runs, they purchase things from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're selling the, the proverbial pickaxes in the, in the gold rush. In a sense, right? We're <laughs> enabling the gold rush in many ways as well. Uh, so that, but yes, in, in a sense, we are, we'd like, we're enabling people to, to make mm -hmm. big advances. Speaking of the gold rush, your revenue is growing like gangbusters. You hired the uh, Tesla's finance chief last year. That's spurring speculation about when you might go public. I know you can't, you're not going to give us timing, but did uh, your um, calculations about when to go public change at all with Lyft uh, going public? and? Or I know it's a totally different business, obviously, but we got a lot of high-profile IPOs this uh, this year coming right. down. It's the certainly, right, it's certainly in the news. There's a lot, uh, but you know, for us, the business has been scaling really well. Uh, and uh, for me, for the goal for all of us is to build a very large company. We've got an incredible team, lots of awesome technology, and a market opportunity that feels boundless. Mm -hmm. And the goal is really to build a very large company. And uh, and so no, no IPO this year. Uh, there, there's no. It's sort of like a. You know, the, the the conditions of the markets are sort of independent. We can go when we need to, and if it makes sense, if it makes sense to go public for the purpose of building a very large company, we'll do it. But Sir, it's up you, to us. you had said hardware, chemistry, software. 
I'm guessing it's the software that is the, the most difficult thing. Uh, and also the thing that is giving us the best insights into what's going on inside the cell. I mean, these are this is the kind of tool we would not have had 50 years ago. The other stuff we might have been able to do, the computers we would not have had. Actually, I'm going to correct you a little bit sure, on this. Please. Software is absolutely necessary and a huge enabler of what we do, yeah. but all the other components, have, have, we've had to innovate just as much. And uh, the hardware, the, something called microfluidics, the chemistries, the biochemistry. All brand new. Mm -hmm. All brand new. We had to innovate and invent all kinds of things and built on, a, you know, on the shoulders of giants. I mean, a lot of the work that's been done in the industry generally over the last 20 years is right. something that we've built on top of it. So all of these parts, and that's one of the things that's been really challenging about the company to begin with, is that we needed to invent a lot of things from all these different areas before we even knew if we had a product. Speaking of giants, you, you came from the Soviet Union. You end up studying under Wally Gilbert at Harvard right? Um, it, that's, that must have been a, a, a tremendous leap for a, a kid from far away. Uh, well, I mean, Wally's a special person. For me, uh, I, I feel very fortunate uh, in terms of, you know, coming, kind of immigrants uh, going into New York and then, you know, ending up at, at Harvard. And I think the, the, the major thing actually there, when I think back to your question, is the sense of like, actually, you know, at some point I actually had this realization, you know, you can actually change the world. Like, you're there, like, and well, other people make things happen, and there's no reason why you can't do it. Can you talk at all about the ethical considerations of genomics? I mean, I feel like this, these kind of conversations come up a lot when we talk about CRISPR and, and gene editing and that kind of thing. You guys are providing the tools for the people who are doing the research, and there's so much positive potential of what could happen. But are you also, is, are you doing anything to prevent, you know, sort of possible negative outcomes or unethical things that might happen with your tools? Well, so at this stage, we're very early in the, in, the, in the kind of in the chain, right, in the process. We're enabling science to be done, and so in that sense, I tend to believe that's a, generally speaking, enabling new science and new discoveries is a positive, is a huge net positive for mm -hmm. the world. Regardless uh, of what they might lead to. So, look, I mean, ultimately, there will be questions, and those questions will need to be dealt with, you know, kind of mm -hmm. in the, you know, the governmental and sort of ethical considerations, but I think... You're putting a lot of faith it, in our government to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough, and, not just, <laughs> and obviously it's not just our government, too, right? Uh, yeah, that, and there's, uh, there's currently no ethical framework for how we're thinking about this, right? Like, there's not, like, a body out there that's establishing how are we going to consider these things, science once they actually become real. Right. Well, so which is why for us, much of the focus is enabling kind of new science so that we can envision enabling new cures. And uh, that's that's the driver for us. Curing cancer seems like a squeeze one more. It's very question. noble. I like it's, it's, it. Speaking right. of ethics, um, I'm just curious. I know it's a totally different field. I mean, but how did the uh, collapse of Ther Theranos and that whole debacle affect the perceptions of biomedicine in general? Did it is it made things more difficult for you, or is it just a non-factor? Yeah, I mean, it's something that's different, but it's I mean, biomedicine, it's a, right? Like, yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, in some sense, we're like the anti-Theranos, right? You, but but uh, to be fair, this box that you're <laughs> yeah. selling looks a heck of a yeah. lot like an Edison. <laughs> we're not making any <laughs> accusations. Right, right. But I, you have proven your science uh, over and over. Yeah, and over. We, we focus but on the science. We've mind. got yeah. right. We have you know close to 400 peer-reviewed publications that are based on our products and our science. We're very open. That's about 400 more than <laughs> that. Yes, like, so. Exactly. They're not so. facing more skepticism or anything. Uh, you know, like we haven't. We actually are. We haven't. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, but, but yeah. Yeah. One of those people had a PhD in genetics from Stanford. <laughs> the other quit Stanford at 19. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Uh, Dr. Serge Saxton, thanks for being with us this morning. We'll be back in just a minute.